Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Leopold Rada. I'm working for the Sir Peter Ustinov Institute here in Vienna. And it is a pleasure for, to welcome you here uh, and uh, to represent the Institute, uh, which is co-hosting today's conference. The Ustinov Institute deals with the phenomenon of prejudice and the negative role it can play in society. And to this end, uh, the uh, Institute organizes uh, scientific conferences. It has a visit uh, visiting professorship at the University of uh, Vienna, and it publishes book books, textbooks, also for schools, uh, uh, aiming at teachers on how to they should deal with the phenomenon in, uh, of uh, prejudice. And uh, on the same subject, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and this is a very important topic as we see it, as it is the same uh, mechanisms of prejudice and uh, the instrumentalization of bias and cliches, which lead to intolerance, discrimination, and exclusion phenomena, which, we are, which are widely used by today's populists from the right, which was actually one of the topics, or the main topic of your conference. So, wish you a very interesting evening. Thank you, Leopold, for your nice introduction. Uh, now it's my turn. I always would like to welcome you very warmly that you came here tonight, even though the weather is not really that uh, attractive to go outside. So I'm happy that so many of you came here to talk and discuss with us tonight. Um, uh, my name is Stephanie Fenkert. I'm the director of the International Institute for Peace, and together with the Ustinov Institute and also the FIUM, which is the Forum Journalism and Media in Austria, have been cooperating in this event today. But we already had a workshop during the day, and there's also a colleague from Germany there. And so, um, just so you know, this is just a public event for the evening. Um, the notion of populism has been omnipresent in uh, last years in publications, in speeches and articles dealing with actual political developments. Already in 2010, the European Union Council President Hermann von Rompuy declared populism as the biggest danger of Europe. Since then, the rise of populism within Europe, but also beyond, has been observed by many with great concern. Denmark has a long experience with the Danish uh, People's Party and is setting a trend now in how populist discourse is uh, adopted by the mainstream. Um, the Danish Minister of uh, Integration, her name is Inger Sto Stoiberg, um, just recently, I mean, um, had a Facebook post where she was showing a cake into the camera where it said 50. It was not her 50th birthday, but I think it was about 50 very strict immigration laws, and I would also be very much interested in how Denmark is coping with all these issues from that point of view. Um, interestingly, however, the Danish experience is not really um, much known about in, 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 in Austria or in, in, in Middle Europe. It is different when it comes to Hungary. I have the feeling that we have a much closer look to Hungary, but we should also take a look to Austria, our own country, because also Austria has a very long tradition of right-wing populism. I'm just naming now the, the, the uh, name, Jörg Haider. Um, so why is it crucial to analyze populism? I would say it is very much crucial because it has an enormous impact on the electoral behavior of voters. Still, we have to be clear about what populists are, what they share, and what they have in common. Now, it's six months before the European elections, the questions arise, do these parties have anything in common? And if yes, what do they have in common? Should Europe be concerned about these trends? Can these parties potentially, potentially become Ellis in Strasbourg? And what led to the rise of right-wing populism? And still, the million-dollar question is, what could be done in order to weaken right-wing populism? I'm now very happy to introduce our speakers. Uh, I start with the left, uh, with uh, Andras Bozoki. Yeah, I very much appreciate you being here. You. He's from Hungary. He's the former Minister of Culture and a Professor of Political Science at the Central European University. Welcome. To my right, I would like to welcome Susie Merritt. Uh, she's an associate professor in comparative migration politics and ethnic relations in the social sciences department of culture and global studies at the Aalborg University in Denmark. Very much welcome. And on 
the right, I would like to also welcome Hannes Svoboda. He's the president of the International Institute for Peace and a former MEP. So welcome, Hannes. Thank you. Yeah. Good that you didn't say I'm the far right. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> As maybe for the procedure, we would like also to make it a little bit more interactive and not have long speeches because I, because I think everyone has a has an opinion on the topic. But still, I would like um, you to begin to share a little bit about the Danish experience because, as I said, Austria is not really that familiar with um, right wing populism in Denmark. So maybe you can share a little bit about your experiencing the, uh, the experiences there. And then I will turn to you, and you can compare it probably a little bit to what Hungary makes special, what is the difference, what do they have in common. And then, of course, we have the Austrian and the European uh, question then waiting there for you. And um, yes, please. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the, to the Institute for inviting me. <laughs> as said, we were speaking about these issues this morning. And as I started this morning, I started here too. Something is rotten in Denmark, but nobody seems to take care of it. Uh, or at least also how the panelists here uh, prepared, it seems like uh, Denmark should be the liberal so country that has this kind of phenomena, and uh, Hungary, the illiberal country that has a, a not that much similar phenomenon, but more dissimilar in terms of a democratic system. So, so I'm here to try to point a little bit out some of the so developments that should make us a little bit more concerned also in what is happening in the Scandinavian countries, because it's not only the case of Denmark, although uh, the Danish case is, uh, let's say, paradigmatic of a party that has been uh, growing in terms of electoral support since so the beginning of the uh, 2000s, uh, and uh, which has become for many, and I think particularly within so the uh, political party system, but also in the perception of very many Danes uh, as a normalized mainstream party of the right. Someone still using this right-wing populism, but this of the populism is slowly disappearing when talking about the uh, Danish People's Party. So, so we have to do with right established uh, post-war democracies uh, with similar welfare state systems, and I will come. Uh, back to this because this uh, is of very much relevance in uh, so the positions of the uh, uh, right-wing populist parties in Denmark but also in Sweden and in Norway and now with that also in Finland to have the whole so, uh, Nordic context and countries that perhaps should not or we would not expect to have this kind of uh, so um, uh, political parties present and at least uh, not at that so um, with that, so um, electoral support, which nowadays for the Danish People's Party has reached the 20% and is still polled very well also for the upcoming elections in spring 2019. Uh, but, I mean, a country that has a very high, so gross uh, uh, domestic product and also a, a, a very um, important so and positive uh, human so uh, development index. And also for very many of you, very many asked me when I come so to uh, Central Europe, but also Southern Europe, why is it the Danes are so happy? So one of the questions is uh, whether this is making them more happy uh, to have uh, also a, a right-wing populist party. This is a question that probably should also be uh, addressed. So uh, the other thing that is kind of so um, uh, paradigmatic of this country is the fact that they are stable, so parties, all of them. For the Danish People's Party, uh, this was so, um, it happened in 2001 under so the uh, uh, liberal and conservative government at that time. So let's say that uh, in this case, it was uh, important the opening, uh, the opportunity that was created so by the, by the so central right coalition in order to so open up and, uh, let's say, disintegrate this form of cordon sanitaire that was created around the Danish People's Party, particularly by the Social Democrats at the end of the 1990s, which was not successful. By letting the party so, um, into so a, a support partner a position, uh, this legitimated somehow some of the uh, um, standings and some of the uh, ideology that the party has, uh, so uh, that characterizes the party, but not only 
both the uh, conservatives and the liberals, and nowadays I would argue also the social democrats have actually co-opted uh, some of the so positions that uh, back in the 2000s were a little bit more characterizing what we called so the radical uh, right uh, populist uh, Danish People's Party. So. So one of the things that is important to say in relation perhaps uh, to a comparison uh, of the uh, Danish People's Party vis-à-vis -vis parties like uh, the FPÖ or the Front National or um, well, other parties around in Europe that are often so uh, compared to the Danish People's Party is that the party had this that is called reputational shield. That means that several of those that started up uh, the uh, DF in the uh, uh, late 1990s were not coming from Nazi or from, uh, let's say, uh, neo-Nazi groups. This is something that perhaps is much more contentious in the case of the Sweden Democrats and is something that is still very much debated in uh, Sweden as regards to so the uh, Sweden Democrats. But this was not the case for the Danish People's Party, which came from a party that was the, um, an anti-tax, anti-establishment, and neoliberal party of the 1970s. So when we speak about so, um, populism in the so Scandinavian spectrum, we have also to relate it to forms of protest and also tax protest that uh, created this first let's say, wave of resentment of the 1970s. Actually, already in 1973, there was this general election that in uh, Danish politics is known as the earthquake election, where the system, the party system that had been very stable in the post-war era was uh, shaken by the appearance of five new parties within it. Among these, the uh, Progress Party were from uh, Pia Kiesko and others that formed so later on in uh, 1995, the Danish People's Party came from as an exit group. So it was both this, let's say, past, and also I would argue the uh, experience that was accumulated during the years within the Progress Party by those who formed the uh, uh, Danish People's Party that related them to politics in another way. So we had to deal with people that were not parvenu or persons that did not have political experience, but they had actually a lot of already political experience within the other party, and they created this centralized party that uh, is a very, let, let's say, hierarchical. And in the words of former so a Danish People's Party leader, the Danish People's Party is a top uh, center party, we know this, and uh, we did it on purpose. We do not want all this like anarchy in our party. We want the party to function so streamlined and so on. So in order to understand the Danish, so uh, let's say, um, a case, it's important to have a knowledge of this long durée. That means not only focusing on what, what happened in the past 10 years, but looking back in time and seeing also how this uh, so, uh, positioning of, uh, of other parties might relate to questions of anti-establishment, for example. Uh, similarly, to the question of uh, anti-immigration. Uh, now, in 2001, I remember my supervisor apologizing for the debate of, um, uh, by several politicians, but particularly by the Danish People's Party, as regards immigrants, and particularly uh, Muslim minorities. So he apologized because this was unheard in the so, uh, Danish uh, political system until then. And let's say that in 2001, under so, the leadership of um, uh, Anas Fogh Rasmussen, that many of you might know because he has been also president of NATO for a while, we spoke about the cultural turn of politics. That means that very many of the issues debated were not only about redistribution of politics and welfare states, about economics, but they were very much about so um, cultural issue, identity, belonging, who belongs to our community and who is actually uh, perceived uh, as, a, as a threat. Hmm? And this, let's say, from 2001 stayed as one of the concerns among the population. Now, when we look at who's actually voting, and I will pr uh, perhaps conclude with this and then we can uh, talk more into the specific, uh, we see that, and this was clear already from the 2000s, that uh, very often those who are 
more concern, but in a negative sense about immigration, because, I mean, concern is, like, very widespread. It's not only people voting for the uh, right-wing populists that is concerned about immigration. Concern can be of very many different kinds. But let's say that concern, in terms of feeling threatened, wanting more security, uh, being afraid of, uh, for example, visible minorities, as, for example, women, Muslim women with a veil or uh, other uh, similar um, so visibility of, of, of being different, let's say, was something that was uh, really used and capitalized by, by this party. And this concern is always coming after the welfare concern. And what did so the Danish People's Party in order to attract particularly these so segments of the populations that were more concerned about both welfare on the one side, globalization, and, and labor market, and on the other side about the cultural issue, they simply intersected these two issues, speaking very much about welfare nationalism and speaking about so minorities, and particularly so uh, Islam as a threat. And this has, let's say, created a kind of, Kitchell would call it winning formula for the uh, Danish People's Party that moved away a bit from the neoliberal politics of the uh, Progress Party, the forerunner of the Danish People's Party, got these more welfareist positions and at the same time inclu included this of the, uh, let's say, cultural issue. In, in Denmark, there's a lot of talk about this Danishness and only to conclude this, I would um, make an example by a quote. We are still interviewing so um, politicians from both the Danish People's Party and other parties in, as regards, for example, to questions of identity. And it's quite interesting how also, let's say, more mainstream parties relate to this. But uh, the Danish People's Party is always the most outspoken as regards to questions of identity, namely Danishness. And in this interview uh, done at this uh, popular meeting uh, on the Isle of Bornholm, that is called Falkemöd, uh, which is something that the Danish uh, politicians have um, uh, created and inspired by the uh, so Swedish so uh, yearly meeting with, with the people where one can talk to politicians and so on. This um, member of the parliament said, uh, and I quote, Danishness, Dansko, is at the core of our history, and this is how he describes the Danishness. The society we have today is the result of a long history with clear cultural and also Christian implications, which have made Denmark what it is today. There are some Danish values, which I mean are the very reason why we have to uphold those core values that make Denmark the good and nice society that we know. There is an egalitarian thinking, which is striking. The relationship between those who rule and the Danish people, where the gap is very little, and I strongly appreciate that. An open society where one can discuss basically everything. It has to do with our historical framework and with some expectations and way to see the world, which I believe it is fantastic and which I do not see in other countries, meaning all other countries. Danishness is an old core social democratic value, although it has a little come out of sight, meaning the, from the social democratic so view. But it has always been there, and which has been the hellmark contrary to the rest of the left wing. As regards to Danishness, we are the only party today which chips in with this, and it says clear, none of the other bourgeois parties does this. So really, they really want to profile themselves as Denmark as something special. So uh, very much tapping into this idea of a welfare state that functions. So, mm -hmm. And I think I will uh, close it here and take the yeah. questions afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much, Susie. I think you said uh, a lot of very interesting things already, because when we talk about populism and populist, we also have somehow to differ what is a populist and what is a politician during an election campaign? Because even all the politicians actually came to realize that populist strategies are working out quite well. But what you said when it comes uh, what is very much uh, crucial is the, 
the anti-establishment feeling, you call it, I think, the long delay of the, of the anti-establishment also in Denmark. So it takes there, it happens there already since a, a long time. And I think what is also very important is what you said, that there is a feeling, that they build upon feelings of uh, that somehow their own culture is in threat. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also what they are sharing all over, especially the right-wing uh, populists in Europe. Another element which is also quite uh, obvious and crucial is the very charismatic leadership and to claim the, to represent the people, like the, the volonté générale. And I think this is also maybe your keyword when it comes to Viktor Orban and, and what Hungary is doing and how Viktor Orban is building up his... Um, um, country under the prejudices of um, right-wing populism. What is your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question and for the invitation. Let me first speak about populism a little bit and then about Hungary. Um, of course, uh, populism is often uh, meant as a charismatic leadership, emotional politics, but we don't know that it is uh, ideology or discourse or some sort of uh, problem of modernization. So what, uh, what is the reason? Is it material reason or identity reason that populism uh, rises? And uh, recently the literature says that populism has some classic elements and there are some new elements. The classic elements are anti-elitism. There is always a binary opposition, the elite and the people. And second, uh, the elites are always bad. Uh, they are the blood suckers. They don't let the society to flourish. And the people is always right. So there is a moral judgment on this. So people is always right. The elites are always wrong. And uh, third is uh, the, the element of anti-pluralism. So, but populists believe that uh, the people is not something... Uh, uh, multicultural or composed by different uh, classes or groups or identities, it is homogeneous. So there is a tendency to homogenize the people, people's culture, uh, politically, political uh, homogenization of people, and um, and that's uh, that's basically the the idea: anti-pluralism, anti-elitism, and morally good position of the people versus the elites. Um, and also, most recently, not only elite, the elites are blamed for all the, all the bad things in the society, but the others, the others, the foreigners, the aliens, uh, Brussels, the European Union leadership, or the migrants, or George Soros, or some uh, inv uh, invisible uh, global capitalists, whatever. So um, that, that is now not simply populism, but right-wing populism, that, that populism comes together with nativism, that mm -hmm. we are the native people, the true people. We belong to the same tribe. Um, blood and ethnicity is the basis of our belonging. And those others are just troublemakers, and they are maybe the international elite are using those migrants to destabilize our society. So this is how it goes, and uh, and also it's important to underline that this is not exactly democratic anymore. So we can say that some sort of populism might be good for democracy because democracy is about the people after all, and it uh, enables people to 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 speak. But this one is using pe the people in order to take advantage. So that's the funny thing without, with populism, that this is not honest. They don't say that, well, it, it promises the repoliticization of the society and give back uh, the chance and the voice to the people. But what is happening that it is emptying the public discourse and homogenizing the society, and it ends up not more democratic but less, more authoritarian. So nativism and authoritarianism are these two new phenomena of uh, right-wing populism. Um, having to keep this in mind, I think what is going on in Hungary, it is uh, interesting because, of course, we have this right-wing populism, uh, not only that, because there is a regime, not just a political party or, or a leader, although the leader is important, 
but uh, but a regime. So, so um, twenty years ago we had some populist parties, you know, representing agrarian interests vis-à-vis -vis the urban population, you know, the classic, the peasants, the workers against the intellectuals, against the educated elite. But now we have a government actually. So populism, not in the opposition, but in the government, but which behaves like being in opposition. It's, it's very funny. This is how populists govern. They don't tell that we are governing. They say we are saving the, the country. There are so many external uh, threats, and we are saving the country from the foreigners, from other international players. So basically we are in opposition to the international elites. And that's the point. They are in power, but they behave like they be, would be in the opposition against Brussels. This is a classic game what the Hungarian political government and elite is playing. They actually use authoritarian techniques. They are deconstructing uh, liberal democracy. But they always pointing to Brussels and Soros and the migrants as the, as the source of the problem. So and they present themselves as as the guarantors of security of the people. So they don't talk about freedom anymore. It's not about freedom, multi-party system, competition, human rights, uh, checks and balances, rule of law. They don't uh, give a, a value, don't uh, associate any value to this. What they promise is that we are going to defend you because the country is under attack and we should feel claustrophobic. There are enemies around. Populism is very, not only populism, but populism particularly is keen on using the discourse of friends and enemies, you know, a la Carl Schmitt. Those are the enemies uh, and we have to, we are going to defend you. So we don't have to, uh, you know, achieve uh, economic development or more freedom, better democracy, better public policy, etc. What we promise is very simple, we will defend you. <coughs> and uh, it's enough if you are good Dane, if you are good Hungarian, good Austrian, you don't have to perform, you don't have to educate yourself, you don't have to upgrade yourself. It's enough if you are good Hungarian that qualifies you for defense. So it, it, uh, it gives the message to the voters that, well, you are okay, you don't have to do anything, we are taking care of you. So these are very simple messages, and that captures, this, that, that type of message captures the rather less educated voter, voters, those who can be more easily manipulated by the state-controlled media. It is very important that unlike in Denmark, in Hungary, the, the so-called public TV is not really public TV. Those are state-controlled television, and they uh, transmit uh, government propaganda. Um, because the leader, Viktor Orban, and his party wants to be re-elected. So they are running in election, and they need to use a heavy propaganda machine in order to keep the, their voters along this friend versus enemy line. They don't need the majority of the people. It's not true that the majority of Hungarians are behind Orban, uh, behind Viktor Orban, because uh, one third of the population don't go to vote at all. Uh, the other two-third is divided and, and one-third is voting for Orban and his party. The other third is voting against him. So actually those who participated in the elections 2018, last time, uh, it was divided. Uh, 51 voted against uh, Orban for the opposition parties and 49 voted for Viktor Orban and his party. So actually he represents the minority of Hungarians, uh, there is an urban-rural divide, but due to the disproportional character of the Hungarian electoral system and all these um, um, tricks to, to, 
to tackle the checks and balances, which are now less and less existent, it is translated, transformed into two-third majority in the parliament. So it is a very disproportionate electoral system. If you have 49% in the popular vote, you can have two-third majority in the parliament. And a few words about Hungary. It, uh, of course, it is a former communist country, so it was part of the Soviet bloc. And therefore, it different. this is similar in that sense to East Germany or Poland or Czech Republic, although there were some traditions of uh, parliamentarism and uh, rule of law or Rechtstaat. Uh, still, uh, for Hungarians, 1945 was not a new starting point, like for a lot of West European countries, but it was just the beginning of another dictatorship. So for us, 1989 was the starting point, and not 1945, or not 1955, like for the Austrians. And that time lag matters, because people are, generations were growing up in, in dictatorship, and uh, comparing to this uh, starting point, what Hungary achieved was remarkable in the 1990s and 2000s. Full uh, rule of law, liberal democracy, eligible to join the European Union, NATO membership, uh, pretty sophisticated institutional system, constitutional court, ombudsman, etc. But still, after a while, uh, it seemed that one thing was missing, the belonging, that the Hungarian population did not feel at home in this new liberal democracy. They felt that this favors the elites, uh, this favors those who could privatize themselves those assets which were inherited from the state socialist uh, state, and they are again the losers. So they, they were waiting for the left-wing party to defend them, but the left was left-wing party was also a modernizing party, sort of center-leftist party, and they did not find a place a risk for rescue. Uh, um, and uh, after a decade or one and a half decade, they moved to the far right because the far right promised them defense and security. And they said that we are the only ones who will fight the international capital against the neoliberals, against these international elites. So the populist condition was there particularly at the time of 2008 when the, there was this global economic crisis plus the incompetence of that time the current left liberal government which was widely seen as corrupt so Orban and his party got the mandate to govern in 2010 with two-third majority uh, to, to, to give security, to offer some chance for survival and uh, the, he started his policies as a left-winger, attacking the banks, foreign banks, etc., and Brussels. But after 2015, when he realized that there is a huge political potential in the migration issue, he, and uh, there was in the meantime an economic development, there is no economic crisis in Hungary, there is an economic development, and still using populism, he changed from... Uh, economy-based policy to identity-based policy around 2014-15 at the year when he visited the funeral of those people who were killed in Paris uh, the journalists and the Charlie Hebdo and then he realized that well there is a new wave of migrants and we have to start a new policy based on against migration he is not an Islamophobe person. He was uh, never used Islamophobe arguments before. Um, sometimes he was even friendly to that, so making some economic deals. But he is an opportunist. He, is, he, he saw the opportunity that now it, this can be politically exploited and capitalized. And then a huge propaganda started from that point based on identity and we are Hungarians, we are the last, last bastions of the Christian Europe, which needs to be defended. And Brussels is driven by the 1968 generation, the left-wingers, the feminists, 
the multiculturalists and those are uh, losing Europe and we have to defend it. So political homogenization, uh, promising defense, xenophobic argument and identity politics. That was the winning card for him and uh, although uh, he could not uh, uh, maintain any, pop any majority in the uh, last elections, he didn't need it because he did everything to divide the opposition um, uh, in very different means. I have no time to elaborate that. But the point is that as long as there is a fragmented left-wing opposition and liberal opposition, he doesn't need to have a real majority. He needs to just keep the most coherent minority in order to win repeatedly the elections. So it's important, identity politics is important to keep a charis for a charismatic leader, to keep those two million, two and a half million people together who believe in him and to divide the opposition and that's the that's the way to, to electoral success. So the big, uh, uh, I mean the news is that even a liberal democratic country can decline back to an illiberal or semi-authoritarian setting and even uh, at the time of economic uh, uh, conjuncture and development one can base his uh, populist policies on identities uh, against, uh, against the representatives of liberal democracy. So there are a lot of lessons which can be learned from the Hungarian case. And this used to be an isolated case for many years. It is not an isolated case anymore. Hungary is not an outlier. The problem of Hungary and the decline of democracy is not just a Hungarian problem. It is a European problem. Because now other leaders are mainstreaming this. Uh, since uh, the election of Donald Trump, uh, Brexit, you know, Putin, Erdogan, Salvini. This is something like one of the mainstream directions within Europe. So one has to pay attention to this more closely than it, than it was done before. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anders. That was very interesting, especially also that you talked a lot about, especially right-wing populism, I would say. I mean, you added to the anti-elitism, the anti-pluralism, that mm -hmm. they try to get a, to, to talk for a homo, homogeneous group, the native people, or as you would say, the, the, the Danishism. Mm -hmm. So it is quite similar mm -hmm. as well there. And um, you also talked about identity politics, which I think is very interesting when it comes to Hungary. And you also mentioned the, the migration and, and the influx of migrants. And all of us know that the election campaign of Viktor Orban this year very much was, uh, relied, uh, did rely on, on, on migration, on, on the topic of migration, even though... Sorry, which is not happening, by even the way, though Hungary they are not coming. The does migrants. not have any migrants. A narrative so, framework, that is a discourse. Yeah, but yes, it's, a, it's a paradox. Forgot and, to mention. Yeah, yeah, it's a paradox, and I think it's yeah. uh, very interesting how this actually operates. And um, I think um, we can now turn to you, Hannes, because he already uh, said some very interesting things. He said uh, he, t he was talking about urban and rural divide in Hungary. Uh, we also heard today that 11 countries in, in Europe uh, now have right-wing populists uh, in their government, somehow ruling. Seven of them, interestingly, are in the eastern part of Europe. And what he also said, which is very interesting, is that as long as the, um, the social democrats or the left-wing parties are so fragmented, it is very, very difficult actually to, to, to fight against right-wing populism. What is your um, conclusion? What would you say for Europe and for Austria, maybe, because we are in Austria and you have been a European politician but also active in, in Austria. What is your opinion on, on these topics? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I have to apologize. I have to leave quite soon, but I think the, the major dialogue should be with our colleagues uh, from uh, Denmark and, and Hungary have another uh, duty to do at, at the Rathaus. Um, I think... Populism, what is populism, especially right-wing populism, is uh, especially characterized, you know, with all the differences you have in different countries, the division between us and them, the right people and the wrong people, uh, and this division is very strong also in Austria. It's not so much a division between us and up there, the elite, so this anti-elitism is, is relatively small, it is existing, with the FP in particular, 
But of course, when they are in the government, then they, they forget about that. <coughs> so I think the, the basic uh, characteristic in Austria is about us, the Austrians, the Danishness, the Austrianness, <coughs> and then the foreigners in general. Now, is this a new phenomenon? And I want to underline that it is not a new phenomenon. If you go back, uh, and I don't, don't want to go back too far, but at least in, in the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, where the Hungarians were accepted more or less as equal, <coughs> more or less, yeah. after some time, but you had always there the German Austrian, the German-speaking Austrian, against the other, especially the Slavic, uh, the Slavic uh, population. And you know that when, uh, after the First uh, World War, we tried to be Aust the German Austria, you have it still on the stamp, German Austria, it's not Austria, German Austria, and they wanted to join Germany. That was forgotten later, especially by FPÖ, when they saw this German Austria is not good, we will have to be Austrian. We are the patriotic party. The right wing is the other patriots. Now, in the meantime, of course, you had the Nazi time in Austria, the, the Nazi development, one could say the Nazi occupation, which was not an occupation because party was an occupation from the inside. Uh, and there was no really thorough dealing with the Nazi system, the Nazi time in Austria. Different to Germany, although oh, even in Germany you have some elements of, uh, you know, accepting now, again, uh, Hitler salute and other things, but in Austria was much less a thorough debate what happened and, and uh, what should happen in order to denazify uh, our country. Um, so, and of course it was also the Jews, the anti-Semitism was very strong. Already in the monarchy time, and here already with the anti-Semitism, which is also interesting, was a combination of economic and identity policy. Because in Vienna there was the criticism, especially by the conservative mayor here in Vienna at that time, uh, against the rich Jews taking over the big companies, which was true in some way. It was not, uh, and, and the nationalization or communalization of the big companies was a, a right activity, but it was always not a fight against the rich one or the capitalist, it was a, against the Jewish capitalist. So uh, we have many of these elements of anti-Semitism and other uh, activities and attitudes against the foreigners for, for many of the time. Then we had, of course, so-called guest workers. But you, those who are a bit older will re re remember we had even some um, slogans so because of the criticism. We asked for guest workers, but people came, human beings came. <laughs> so already at that time there was this kind of astonishment. There are human beings who do the work for us. Um, and um, then, of course, there were the refugees. It is true that in Austria the refugees coming from Hungary especially were welcomed. But they were also welcome because they passed through to Canada, United States, and to other countries. Uh, Poland, and uh, from the, the, the Prague uh, Spring. So many of these refugees, and there are many states also here, especially from the second and third wave, and they were more or less accepted. It changed, uh, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, again, many more or less were defunding into the different... Um, black market, grey market, uh, labour market, it was in time of economic progress, in time of economic growth, where you could accept them. But it was a bit different and became different when I was Syria and Afghanistan from Muslim countries. Uh, here where the cultural effect was much stronger than in the time before. But uh, even then it was, uh, what I wanted to show is a continuation of many prejudices. When I uh, became a uh, member of the Viennese uh, city and regional government, I asked uh, my staff to ask the, an institute to do um, uh, a public op opinion poll about the attitude of the Viennese towards other countries and other citizens. And it was quite interesting. On top, in, in the positive element, were the Hungarians, uh, the Germans, and the Italians. German Italians change sometimes one, sometimes two, so they were interchangeable. And the lowest were the Polish and the lowest were the Turks. So 
you, you see that even with Turkey, of course, the, 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 the occupation of Yen by Ottomans or by the Turks, uh, hold, also in the history books, they are the enemies, and they were quite low. With the Polish, it was a bit different because it was strange because the Polish helped us to defend Vienna against the Turks. But anyway, they were not at the same level. You saw quite, there were quite a big differences between uh, the countries and uh, the, the evaluation or acceptance of different people. So we always had this kind, we are not the same. We are not the same human beings, no. We are the best. Then there are others who couldn't we accept, and then there are others we really didn't want uh, to to accept. But especially, of course, with uh, with Muslims, with different religion, also we occupied and annexed uh, a Muslim um, a majority country with Bosnia Herzegovina, but it was a long time ago, and maybe they more or less stayed outside. Um, but this gave, of course, the right wing to really bring into the cultural effect. Because again, I want to underline the economic issue is an issue, especially when Stephanie mentioned urban area and, and rural area, and we discussed this today. But as long as it's only an economic issue, it's not the big question of, of, of right-wing <coughs> or any kind of populism. If it's combined with the identity issue, especially religious, Christian, against Muslim, uh, Austrians against others, from the Far East, or Far East also in Europe, uh, not well educated, poor, uh, then it was a different thing. With the poverty also had played a, a role insofar, as we discussed it also today, and there was a study done on the effect of the welfare systems on the question of populism and readiness to accept refugees. And it's very clear, and there is a, a strong uh, correlation. The stronger a welfare system is, normally, the more you are critical about refugees coming in because you have to share something. If you don't have anything to share, people can come. It's, I mean, you see African countries and many other countries around the world. But if uh, you have a very established, public, organized welfare system, then many people are very critical about <coughs> others with whom you have to share. And this is, of course, promoted again by by uh, right-wing populists, and we have the Austrian government who cuts the benefits uh, for uh, people working here but having children in other countries, uh, and the minimum uh, wage or the minimum income will be cut especially for those, and now the published uh, figure, which is uh, anyway a wrong figure, but they published it and said 60% of those who get the minimum income are with a, with a migration background, which is also very strange. So the government says, if you have a, 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 a migration background, you are perhaps not justified that your children get uh, benefits or get the same benefits as those who have only Austrian parents, whatever that means. So I think this, uh, this uh, welfare uh, issue is, is very much uh, uh, used to promote uh, the idea or the fear, the more refugees will come, the more it will be uh, that your subsidy will be cut because they uh, get so much uh, money and they misuse the money. And as we saw, I think it was from your side, when a lady with the headscarf is is um, trying to get some money from the from the cash machine. Similar things were also shown in in Austria recently about uh, the the money coming. Now, uh, to be short, what can be done with that was the question of Stephanie. What can be done? I think one has to be very um, clear that our countermeasures are limited. One issue which is very very important is to keep at least the institutions in contact, intact. Institutions are very important that uh, you are not going down in your democratic uh, um, procedures and development. And this was happened, of course, especially in, in Hungary, also with the pension and uh, to, to retire the, 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 the judges, to change the electoral law, and this is what uh, has been tried now also in, in, in Poland, where the commission hopefully is in some way successful. 
And this is, of course, what uh, Trump tries to do in, in the United States, at least with the nomination of judges. So if you change institutions, either weaken it, giving them less rights to intervene into the democratic process, or at least change the personnel and give totally different judges, then it is very dangerous. As long as the institutions function, it's an element of democracy that you have right-wing parties and you have uh, other parties, if you have left-wing parties, but at least this is an element of democracy. But once uh, they, they try to fight uh, institutions, at least what they do in Austria to, to delimit and reduce the power of some of the institutions, like the social partnership, because here comes the authoritarian element into it. If you have the social partners, the, the trade unions and, and the employers association who negotiate, and this is a very strong pillar of Austrian democracy, if you reduce the power of them, if you don't deal with them, if you don't uh, discuss issues with them, especially working hours and other issues, of course, already you do some steps in that direction. But nevertheless, so far in Austria, the basic institutions are functioning, of course, with uh, other people in top positions, uh, some changes uh, will come. And the second, of course, is the opposition, and that was also discussed uh, in the morning, because somebody said, yes, we have to come back, uh, social democracy, to their whole old class-oriented uh, uh, policies. But society changed. If you see, who, who is the working class today, especially in Austria? <coughs> it's most of the migrants. The things which were done in former times by Austrian citizens are mostly done by migrants. Many of them don't have even the right to vote because they are not Austrian citizens. So to go back is, is a bit uh, irrelevant and not very, very uh, thoughtful because many of the voters of social democracy, they went up the ladder, even if the whole ladder was also moving up, but also they moved up. In the time... And therefore, the social democracy tried to adapt. I'm not defending it, and I said many mistakes have been made. That is true. But um, one has to see that the society changed and the, the structure changes. It's not by chance that now at this time we have this kind of development of, of the right wing because there are structural changes in the economy where many of the people who were on the streets in some 20 years ago, if they would have see this development. Today are not on the streets because they are integrated more or less into a upper, uh, upper part of the society. Who is now on the streets sometimes, like in France, are different people from, uh, from the former times. It's more the bourgeoisism, it's more people from the middle class, uh, especially the middle class of regions which have not been perhaps dealt with in the, with the economic development in a favorable sense, feel themselves at the fringe, feel themselves pushed away. Yes, these people, uh, they go and, and, and go perhaps to the streets, but it's not the normal, uh, what we thought about the workers in the past, because the workers of the past are very dependent, weakened migrants who are not... Uh, uh, you know, have not the power the, uh, to go to the streets, and the others are more in the in the middle class or in in the in the at least in the lower partly in the central middle class have been rising up, and therefore it is only possible if our opposition is broadening its is broadening its its uh, attractiveness and combining, of course, the social issues which are still here combining it with the liberal questions of democracy, of participation, uh, to defend the values or the principles of a democratic development we had in the past. Not a way back alone, of course social issues has been forgotten, has to be taken up, but uh, combine the social issues with many questions of democratic behavior and interesting of, uh, prom of promoting citizenship and that is my final point, making it very clear that our societies could not function without the majority of migrants, guest workers, etc. we have. Nobody really said, 
to our citizens, okay, let's think we don't have migrants in our health services. We don't have migrants in our cleaning services. We don't have migrants uh, caring for the old people for 24 hours in their home. May, we don't have uh, enough construction service. Even now, already, with the majority of, uh, uh, especially in Vienna and the big cities, of construction workers are migrants from other countries, from Balkans, uh, but even also now from Turkey, Syria, and so on. If they would all leave, certain sectors of industry would break down. And this, of course, is also something for the, what the social democrats uh, missed, or what, what I missed from social democrats also in the past, to make it very clear that these migrants are part of our society. We cannot adapt as, unfortunately, in, in, in I would say in, in, in Denmark, and I had many criticism also with Tony Henry Smith and some others, that they adapted to that policy. We didn't really adapt, but we left the question aside. We didn't raise the issue. We said many, very often, raised uh, in the Social Democrats said, forget about it, don't speak about migration. This is not an issue which is popular. At the end, it became very popular, but on the other side, and from the other side, I think that was our mistake, not so much the adaptation and taking over of the slogans, but uh, avoiding the issue to raise, and if you avoid such an issue, it will come back in, 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 a, in another way, but from the other side, from the right wing. So finally, I think, um, I think what you said is, in, in many elements are true also for Austria, but basically I would say in Austria, right wing populism is very strongly connected with the migration issue, or with issue of of, of um, people and groups which have always been targeted as the enemy or as the one who is not the real Austrian. We had even uh, from the People's Party once against uh, Bruno Kreisky um, a poster who said you have to vote the real Austrian. And meaning Bruno Kreisky is a Jew and we, of course it wasn't said like this, but he's not the real Austrian. So this real Austrianism is something which is very, very, very strong, and unfortunately, as I said, social democracy did not really fight against it in a, in a strong way, and even Kreisky himself made some mistakes in that connection. Um, but I think it, it will be a hard way and a long way, and I don't think it's an easy thing just to change uh, the right wing uh, and to fight it back. It will take some time until people notice that the right-wing populism is promising a lot of things they cannot fulfill, and we have to survive in the meantime and fight for the principles of democratic development. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, this was also very interesting, and we can see that even though the countries are very different, they have a different political context, a historical context, but they share some, uh, some similar elements. I have uh, one last question to you. Please answer very, very shortly, which is a little bit provocative, but I think it's also important to be a little bit provocative in this sense. Because we've been talking a lot about right-wing populism today. When we talk about right-wing populism, there is also such a thing as left-wing populism. It's not really that um, so many people in, in... It's not really that big of an issue in Europe, but we also we can discuss of, uh, if Cyprus is a left-wing populist or not, but we can also discuss of uh, Putin and others being right-wing populists and also probably Podemos in Spain. But uh, definitely Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales in Latin America, they are, are left-wing populists. And Karl Mudde and, and um, um, Mudde and Kaltwasser argue that uh, it is not really populism which is the problem, but it is the ideology it attaches to, which means populism itself is nothing unless you attach to other authoritarianism or nationalism, but you can also attach yourself to liberalism and socialism, meaning this could actually include different people. Um, so the question is, could right-wing populism be fought in Europe by introducing a strong left-wing populism? What would you say? <laughs> uh, this sounds provocative to yeah. my ears. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, basically because, I mean, as a right-wing populism scholar, I um, somehow... Um, um, I'm, I'm not feeling that comfortable in making this like a way of, uh, because you analyze the right, this applies uh, specularly to the, to the left. 
And I'm also a little bit skeptical about uh, using concepts such as the construction of the people from the left-wing perspective, because, I mean, this has been so much co-opted and, uh, uh, let's, let's say, um, used by the so, uh, right-wing that it's very difficult for the left, for left-wing, uh, let's say, project to so reappropriate this framing. And only the example of this Denmark, Denmark in itself and Danishness is not per se a negative value, but it has been filled in with so much content that uh, uh, somehow is more to exclude other people, so to point to those that do not belong to the community, that it's difficult to reframe it. Mm. So I, was, I would say that uh, this uh, uh, project, at least this alternative, should find framings that do not recall the same like images of something that excludes. Uh, I mean, the very use of the flag, which in Denmark is something that uh, it's used also for celebrating birthday for example. It's uh, something that is very often connected to the Danish People's Party, which makes a, a, a use of the flag in all kinds of occasions, but mainly with the purpose of re uh, reminding us about uh, this that uh, um, a scholar in, uh, called Michael Billy calls uh, banal nationalism. So to remind ourselves of our belonging mm -hmm. somehow, and it's uh, like uh, difficult to so reframe it in a way that uh, that would be of the left. So I'm a little bit skeptical when I hear, for example, um, projects a la Chantal Mouffe, or that mm -hmm. we should, if we have a populism of the right, then we should so uh, react or propose a, a, a populism of, a, of the left. Although uh, parties like uh, Podemos uh, is actually feeling quite comfortable in this by having their own so idea of uh, how to read uh, hegemony and, 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 and also the uh, political so perspective in this. But uh, I would think we need really new framings, and perhaps this is a framing in the sense that in Denmark the, the problem has been when uh, guest workers uh, have turned from being the Turkish worker to the Muslim. And this has been done also by very many of the so social democrats at the municipalities of the big cities in the 1990s, so before the Danish People's Party, who actually pointed their finger to the Muslims minorities when they were not of use any longer. So uh, in the 1980s, during the crisis, when we just passed this upturn, economic upturn, and define them as uh, those who were using the social benefits of the municipalities, who were creating these ghettos and so on. And today we have Mette Freilsen, who is the uh, so, uh, leader of the Social Democrats, saying, oh, the majors, the majors of the 1990s from almost municipality, from the outskirts of Copenhagen, were right. We were wrong. She said this in uh, open words. We had to be more careful in not creating this so ghettos. And today, question of these weeks, uh, ghetto plans uh, actually define in the cities places that have to be well, destroyed and where people have to be so uh, di displaced in other areas, despite the fact that these people do not want to be displaced. And the criteria to make these ghettos is on the basis of unemployment, on the basis of immigration background, on the basis of uh, criminality, and other things that actually uh, so uh, individuate so these, uh, uh, these areas in, in very many of the uh, urban areas that we have today. So it has a major impact on, uh, on um, also on society, what so the, let's say, mainstream left is doing and how they are actually using same frames rather than creating a, a new... new ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. Maybe you're very shortly on the same yeah. question. A very interesting <laughs> question, uh, and uh, it's thought-provoking. Uh, the dominant discourses are presented that the, on the one hand there is the neoliberal, rational, technocratic, managerial discourse. The other is the voice of the people, the, the populist right-wing, this nationalist discourse. And of course I don't like this dichotomy because... Uh, these are two extremes, and I don't, I cannot identify myself any of these. So it's, it's. I think something is wrong with this. Um, social democrats should uh, somehow work on this and prove that there is not only one voice of the people, but there are different voices of the people, 
and uh, people cannot be, you know, mm -hmm. nationalized, so to say, by the right-wing parties. Uh, and that's very interesting with uh, Professor Svoboda mentioned that, you know, the uh, social democracy voiced the working class previously, the Austrian working class. But now there is no Austrian working class anymore, but, but the migrants are the new working class. But the migrants cannot vote for the Social Democratic Party because they, they are not citizens of this country. So, so, and then what to do? Then give them citizenship to vote for the Social Democrats. But then when they get the citizenship, then they might not vote for the Social Democrats because they are happy to be Austrian citizens and want to exclude the other migrants. So that is a trap of the social democracy, and somehow social democracy should find an answer to this problem, and, and how class issues are transformed into race or identity or religious uh, issue by the, by the far right. So I, I am uncomfortable for the, with this, and I think that something should be figured out. And I like what Chantal Mouffe suggests, that maybe a, a new political discourse should be invented to, to help the, the democratic forces. So the sort of, and today everybody is populist in the sense that there is a, a new media and there are very short messages on TV, particularly in campaign period. So if you, if you don't make yourself uh, simple enough, people simply cannot hear you. So the, those politicians should make themselves uh, be heard by the, by the voters. So I think, I, I, I don't know the solution, but I, I think that um, uh, it is not good if the discussion is just on the axis of neoliberalism versus right-wing populism. Mm. And also it is not good if the social democrats only speak in a very sort of rational, a bit alienated uh, intellectual language, um, because politics is about uh, rationality, emotions, and passions as well. We know it from uh, Machiavelli that, that politics without passion is, is not, uh, not effective. So I think uh, when we talk about the innovation of the left, I think they should be more sort of popular and they should get out from this trap. I, I, I am anti-populist. I don't think that populism will solve the problem because liberal democracy should be based on institutions and populism usually anti-institutional. So it's dangerous if there are two le left-wing and right-wing populism against the democratic institutions. <laughs> That's very, very dangerous. Yeah. But on the other hand, I... I dislike the monopolization of the uh, language uh, of the uh, language of passion by the far right. So this uh, uh, there must be competition in the narratives and in the <coughs> political talks as well. And if there is a left wing competitor to the right wing populism, it's better than just have one <coughs> monopoly of discourse by the far right. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to... Briefly, briefly before no, briefly. I unfortunately uh, go... Yes, uh, I agree. You, you described <coughs> the dilemma very well, especially now when you didn't do anything or not enough for the migrants who stayed here, you know, so-called guest workers, then it's uh, very difficult, because especially when they come from very, let's say, macho society, then they vote rather for a macho on the right wing instead of uh, for social democracy. But... Uh, you're right, we have to go out of the dilemma, but how is the other question? So maybe the next time you come and, and tell us. No, but I, I think I want to underline what also you said about the emotion, I think at least on empathy. We, and it was mentioned this uh, today, we won the, the last election in, relatively in Vienna uh, after this big uh, migra migration flow inflow into our city by underlining the empathy we have to have with people who are in need. Now you cannot repeat it all the time, and it's maybe more difficult if no refugee, new refugees are coming, but those who are here, but not enough has been made for integration. But anyway, I think empathy 
is something you have to have, but for everybody. Our, one of the mistakes, many of was done, that we had empathy or explained and expressed empathy for the newcomers, but not for those who were here, but who had also problems. And if you hear very, very pragmatically on the radio, every day news about refugees and what we do and should not do and can do, then all the citizens say, okay, what about me? The refugees, they, they deal with it, but, but I have also problems. My children have no job, or my children have difficulties to get that kind of job. So I think that was one of the mistakes, that um, we divided, all, even, let's say, those who help the refugees, divided the society between the refugees, we have to care for because they are poor, and the others, you know, they are, maybe they are poor, but we don't have really to, to care for them. There's one element. Second element, I think a very, very pragmatic policy again, when you spoke about the city, what Vienna did with much success, not always maybe, um, is to have a very mixed situation, not to create ghettos, to have uh, also public uh, housing in areas where there are many foreigners in order to have uh, also this mixture. Unfortunately, for some years, in the last, let's say, five to seven years, we did not do enough of that public housing, um, where you know those who are here for a longer time have the right to go into it. If they are Austrian or not, it's not so important, but they have to stay here for some time, and most of them, they are Austrians. So I think a very specific policy in, in cities to fulfill the wishes and the demands citizens have, irrespective if they are migrants or not, or whatever the past is. Big difficulty for social democracy, of course, is the countryside, where we are not a stronghold, mm -hmm. and where the prejudice, even against cities in general, is very strong. If I go to the countryside, what I get told about that it is very unsafe to walk around in Vienna because of the refugees and what happens. You know, this is rumor is is very much spread even in the countryside, and here this is very difficult because you see, if you live in the city. You see, things are different, and the vote is not so much to the right. If you're outside, you don't see what is happening, but you have that kind of rumor uh, defining your attitude, and you, you go even more to the right wing. But I, I think, um, just to, to answer your question, I, I don't think left-wing populism is, is the answer. Especially Latin America, sometimes I have a doubt, you know, for example, terrorism, so what was it, left or right? So left, once you are very populist, you always have the, the incentive to go very much to the right or to find some enemy. And once, and here I agree fully, once you have an enemy uh, in society, I'm, I'm, uh, I think that democracy is, is very much weakened and is, you put holes into the democratic uh, development of your country. And therefore, I think it's not an answer. No, it's not an answer. The answer is concrete to take up the interest and the, the demands of the people and um, not repeat the division between the refugees you have to do something and those others who are left over. And if here social democracy finds some answers, I think at least we can have a stabilization of our of, of uh, democratic uh, societies. Yeah. And, and this talk of enemy is already non-democratic, yeah, right? Absolutely. Because it should be taken as competitor or yeah. adversary, yeah, but not enemy. Yeah. It's yeah. But populism too harsh. is an enemy. And yes, yes, yes. Populism yes. for me is always negative, even if yeah. it's so-called left. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have time for some questions, so um, please, for questions or comments, uh, raise your hand. You start then. <laughs> I do understand, and uh, I do agree that... Uh, Migration is one of the most uh, uh, effective factors now in, uh, in getting power in the, in the right wings in the Europe. Um, but uh, I was missing the, the, to, to get some notices about the understanding of the people about the European the Union. Mm. Many of the countries in, the, in Europe now are frustrated about this, uh, this organization, which I, I I personally, I'm a favor of the European Union, and I think it's one of the biggest projects and most effective projects in the, in the last history. Um, but the people are uh, frustrated. And then you see this Brexit, for example. Um, is um, understood that the mostly is not because of the, the migration, because the 
migration of Muslims that happened so many years before to England. Um, but uh, the most effective reason that the Brexit uh, came was uh, because of you know, the, uh, to get the independence of the uh, United uh, European Union. So what is in your country, the opinion about it? But uh, Hungary, I know a little more. And um, what do you think about this? this uh, and uh, what we can do about this? Because uh, this is a very, the <clears throat> very the part of the uh, part uh, in this uh, project, but uh, people understand it very negative about it. Mm. All the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the one of the most. Mm. And the second uh, thing I would like to know is about. Uh, <clears throat> The difference um, in Denmark between migrants of Muslims and non-Muslims, because you have also a lot of migrants from Hungary, from Poland, from non-Islamic countries. Uh, how much? How the difference is it, or, or how is the, the the balance between these two groups? Okay. And uh, one thing that uh, Dr. Soboda said, uh, I, I am not really read. Uh, I agree with it, is that uh, although that we have a lot of um, uh, I, mm, migrants, the students, and, and uh, the, the elements of the economy, the, like flake, like uh, uh, construction, like uh, you know, the cleaning, and like this, but uh, and he said, if they are not here, then the economy breaks. On the other hand, when these people, with the level of their education and the level of this uh, 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 religious that they have, if they are here, then they break the, the kind of the democracy thinking, uh, uh, because the most of the most of Islamic people who are coming here, for example, from the, the Afghanistan and. Uh, Arabic countries, they have no, no, no relation to the democratic because it's not a not democratic uh, religion. Yeah? Thank you very much. I think it was very interesting questions. I mean, maybe maybe you want to start because there was one uh, question directly addressed to you about the situation in Denmark. Uh, the yeah, as migrants. regards. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll take this of the European uh, Union. Well, it's. Um, it's very interesting, actually, because, of course, Denmark looks very interested at what happens in the UK. Uh, but Denmark has always had a rather strained situation in relation to uh, EU. Uh, because, I mean, uh, for example, uh, in the 1990s and uh, yeah, until the 2000s, uh, the uh, strong, let's say, opposition towards uh, the uh, EU as a political so, project was coming from the left wing. So much of the left wing, uh, particularly, let's say, the more radical left, but uh, also parties such as the Socialist People's Party were against, against it. And also, as we know, Denmark has its own currency still, uh, like in Sweden and, uh, in, the, uh, and in, uh, in Norway, which is not part of the EU, but is part of Schengen. And also the, these opt-outs. So for a while it has been discussed whether so to enter fully or not. This has completely out of the political agenda and the situation is that so from the left wing part these parties have moved towards a more let's say positive uh, so vision and understanding of the EU and for the first time the uh, unity list which is the most radical uh, so left wing uh, party in the political system will so run the European uh, parliamentary elections of 2019. So something is changing there, getting more closer, whereas so the uh, major issues also within, so the government, because the Liberal Party and partly also the Conservatives are very much pro-EU, whereas the uh, Danish People's Party has been traditionally, what they say, against more EU. So they would so like this free market, but getting rid of all what uh, they mean uh, impinges or uh, weakens the uh, Danish sovereignty. But since they have this, uh, 
responsibility of being so a partner of uh, the minority cabinet, they've always downtoned this. Uh, so trying not to speak too much about this, but looking at Brexit as one possible solution and, for example, saying, see, we have to be careful because this happens if you get involved and you want to get out of it. So uh, maintaining basically so the uh, uh, four opt-outs and the uh, so uh, um, Danish crown as a currency and so on. So it's, it's, it, it is a very strange situation that makes it a little bit difficult to understand how they will move, for example, in relation to European uh, parliamentary elections. And we do not have, for example, lists yet, uh, and this will come together so with national elections and so on. So it seems like the European Parliament elections is a little bit like set aside for the moment being, but uh, the parties try not to so problematize it too much for avoiding that. Uh, so these agreements uh, can, uh, can, can come up, particularly for the so, uh, government, so coalition. As for the immigrants, I mean, the... Uh, uh, Romanians and the uh, uh, Polish are uh, among the biggest so, um, groups in Denmark at the moment, uh, particularly after 2007 with the opening. And there has been a little bit of the debate as relates, for example, to social benefits. For example, this that uh, working in Denmark gave the right to get, for example, children uh, checks that could be sent to so family still living in Romania or still living in Poland and so on. And this somehow uh, triggered this, as, as we saw it in the UK, this discussion of uh, how much do they get and uh, to what extent should we limit this and so on. Uh, this is still uh, under debate, but uh, they do not, uh, they are not targeted in the same way as Muslim minorities are. So let's say that the major target in this identitarian, so uh, political, so um, way to uh, define Danishness and so on, uh, Islam is the prior so, um, target which doesn't so affect the other groups as concerns this uh, discussion about values, principles and so on, but more perhaps uh, sometimes as regards, for example, welfare benefits and so on. But since the two do not connect, they, uh, they are much less, uh, let's say, uh, threatened or not considered to, in the same way as threatening minorities. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, just very briefly, because the question was rather to, to the Danish case. Um, mm, yeah, I think in uh, East Central European countries are pro-European. Uh, it is funny that uh, Hungary uh, votes for Viktor Orban on the one hand, but still 70% supports the European Union, which mm. is one of the highest in, in, in Europe. So, um, And obviously the political elites of these countries who are benefiting from the material uh, the, the compensation... They have, in other countries? Hmm? Excuse me? No, because you said 75% of people are for European. Because for uh, the EU, those who are living in Hungary. In other countries and it can travel because of the freedom uh, of movement, yes. Uh, it, it can be that in the last uh, seven years, uh, about half a million people left uh, Hungary, and uh, many of them are working in Germany, Scandinavia, and also in, the, in England, particularly the UK. Uh, according to some estimates, uh, London is the second largest Hungarian city after Budapest. And uh, probably these family ties are important. So there are money which is sent back to the family from, from, from those relatives. So even if politicians decide to leave the EU, that I doubt very much, uh, those uh, these linkages are very important. Uh, uh, Non-political linkages, family linkages, friendship circles, solidarity networks, which keep these countries within the EU. As for politicians, they are very happy to be in the EU because they can blame the EU for the bad things and they can take the benefits uh, also partly for themselves yeah. because there is a corruption on this cohesion fund as well. Uh, but uh, um, in the case of Hungary, uh, the working class is not the migrants, still the Hungarians and the poorest ones 
So when the government changes the labor labor law, uh, which negatively affects the poorest workers, just because it uh, helps the car factory German car factories in Hungary, then it is uh, it is a decision to support so to support those uh, capitalists with against their own voters against their own people. So it's sometimes Hungary or Romania gives a, a bit of flesh to think back to Latin America, this comprador um, political elite or comprador bourgeoisie who are able to collaborate with those modernizing um, modernity islands which exist in these countries. So it's it's a bit different in those countries which are not taking migrants but uh, there is an emission of migrants to the to the Western countries. Mm-hmm. And one last thing about the UK. It's an interesting whether the Scandinavian countries can follow the UK example or not. But I, uh, there can be good arguments that the UK is a very peculiar case. So they never ever identified themselves with the European Union historically. I mean, it was very difficult for them to get in in the 70s. And even in the everyday discourse, they were talking like we go to Europe from from the British Isles. So Europe was was a distance from for them. It they did not feel that they are part of Europe on a daily basis. That was my impression. And uh, and the uh, British uh, tabloids, newspapers, press were pretty anti-European all the time in the last thirty years. So. So there was a propaganda against the European Union, which was, I think, which was deadly, uh, created a deadly result. And even within the UK, Scotland and Northern Ireland are different from, from England without London. Yeah. So London is pro-European, Scotland pro-EU also, but England without London was against so it's i think it's a, it's a complicated i don't expect that denmark will repeat the mm. the british story mm. thank uh, you maybe i am wrong <laughs> you will tell me <laughs> <laughs> thank you there is one last question and maybe another one we put them together and yes, then yes. um a short answer and then we can uh, leave it conclude yeah please uh, in the absence of my friend hannes uh, i would just like to comment uh, on your question Uh, concerning right-wing and left-wing populism. Uh, This question wasn't provocative. Uh, It was simply wrong. Because I don't know how familiar you are with Austrian history. The Austrian history of the last century, you will find not one single example for left-wing populism. On the contrary, the democracy was at least twice destroyed in Austria, in 1933 and in 1934, and in 1938. And it wasn't the social democracy uh, which destroyed democracy. On the contrary, uh, if you want to criticize uh, social democratic party, you would have to criticize this party for her almost naive belief in democracy, her naive trust in institutions, which they defended in 1933, 1934. Uh, 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 so in Austria, there is simply no uh, comparison possible between the right wing populism, which is a fact, and something like a ghost of a less left-wing uh, uh, populism, populism which never existed in this country. Democracy not existed. Yeah, yeah, that is. Um, I'm not commenting comment. on that, but um, yes. there was another one there. Uh, I would like to raise, to raise a question about generations because uh, mm-hmm. I'm thinking when I listen to to the speakers. I was wondering if there is, um, or how big is, if there is a difference, and if there is a difference, how big is the difference um, 
when analyzing the, the, the results of elections and when you compare the different age groups, mm -hmm. is there a difference? And if yes, how is it between um, the different generations? And the background of my question is, of course, is there hope for the, <laughs> the younger generations are becoming stronger? Because referring to what, what Mrs. Holder said first about who is demonstrating right now in the, during the Thursday demonstrations in Vienna, the, the biggest group are young people. Mm. Yeah. Not in the middle class, the, the saturated middle class, it's young people. And of course, I'm aware it's probably students from the university, very educated people, but the biggest group are young people. Okay, thank you. And very shortly, please, very shortly. I would have a question, Mr. Vosovsky. Yeah. On the one side, you say 70% of the population in Hungary are pro you. On the other side, earlier you said we they support Orban. Belonging. Yeah. They don't feel at home. That's my question. Hannes Svoboda would have questioned when he said those who help the migrants introduce the division between those who need the help and those who don't need help. That was another question. Mm -hmm. But you're belonging. Mm -hmm. And what is missing, what is lacking? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please, your answer, and then also uh, maybe you can Yes, um, I agree with you. There is no left-wing populism in Austria, and there is no left-wing populism in Hungary, because left-wing populism was occupied by the state socialist or communist uh, politics. So after the collapse of communism, left-wing populism is uh, non-existent, because uh, those were the socialists. Uh, Left-wing populism is something like a Mediterranean or Latin American uh, or Central American phenomenon, but that existed actually. So I I would not dismiss that this is is, is populism is only right can be the classic studies of populism by a lot of Argentinian and uh, Brazilian authors uh, discuss this because that was anti-American anti-business, anti-US, so it was closer to the left. Um, mm, yeah, the generations, okay. Uh, it's hard to say because uh, 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 it is changing every, every decade. You know, 10 years ago, uh, young people were rather on the far right against the left liberal government supporting Fidesz and Jobbik in Hungary, because that was so-called revolutionary force against the status quo. But now Orban is in power for eight years, and uh, young people today, uh, they see this mature Orbanism as the establishment. So they are revolting against this uh, status quo, and they are... Um, frequently those people who spend some years studying abroad in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Paris, Berlin, London, and they come back and they see that Hungary is so much different from those places. So they want to come back and they come back and want to make it a normal country. So they, there is a rising left liberal opposition to, the, to this uh, far-right uh, regime. I don't know in the next 10 years what will happen, but I expect that this opposition will be stronger and stronger. And the older generation are divided between Fidesz and uh, the socialists, the, the medium 40s, people in their 40s, 50s, more like Fidesz, and the younger generation are in opposition to the... So there is hope <laughs> to your question. <laughs> Uh, belonging, yes. I mean, uh, Orban could be successful with the vote of the minority, but but the majority of Hungarians feel they belong to Europe, but the propaganda suggests that Europe is more about Christianity and traditions, and European Union is something like an artificial thing. And maybe we can distinguish between membership and belonging. Because uh, you know Hungary was a member member of the Warsaw Pact, for instance, and the Soviet Union economic sphere, without belonging. So there was a membership, but people did not identify with that membership. 
So in these countries, I think the case of Poland, Hungary, we should always investigate the, the different meaning of membership, which can be formal, and belonging, which is informal. And I feel that there is a belonging, but certainly there are segments of Hungarian society, mostly in the eastern part, in the rural areas, in the little villages, among the less educated people who, who don't feel belonging to, European, to Europe. They are just uh, supporting the charismatic leader. So there is a divide, but the larger part of Hungary feel uh, belonging to Europe, even if they don't understand the European Union uh, mechanisms. Thank you very much. Yes, I think I will address this of the generations. I will start from uh, yeah, the, the, the bad news is that uh, since the uh, Danish People's Party got so much normalized into Danish politics, uh, it's much less problematic to vote for it and also to declare that one votes for it. Um, so they have closed up some of the gaps that made it previously, uh, years ago, a, a party that was uh, overrepresented by older cohorts uh, and by male, for example. So there was also this gender um, aspect that still is still present, but not to the extent that we can speak so much of a gender gap any longer, uh, which is often what is discussed about uh, in relation to the uh, uh, right-wing populism, for example, mainly male that vote for this. And also, let's say, nowadays, uh, they also attract younger Generations and they try to do this also by promoting so uh, younger so members of the parliament. So they have a certain number of uh, young politicians involved that speak for uh, so both at the local levels and also the national level that speak a little bit different words than so the more established uh, older so uh, politicians uh, in, in in the party. The good news is that uh, in general, so uh, younger generations do vote for. Uh, left parties uh, from the center, uh, from new parties, like uh, this uh, new party that has uh, emerged in recent years, the uh, alternative, that uh, mm -hmm. has this uh, like um, uh, environmental so agenda that uh, is, is, looks very so attractive for very many of the new generations. So it is basically also the only party that is so much out outspoken when it comes to environmental issues, for example. And also do vote so for more mainstream parties. The problem is that with age, there's a tendency to become a little more conservative, so to move away particularly from, let's say, what are the more um, conceived like radical in the political spectrum, so parties, and move towards the center. So, um, But the hope is also that education makes a difference. Uh, that means that education is a very good indicator uh, for not voting if you have a longer education for a, a, a radical a, or a right-wing party. So perhaps with time there will be a shift, if not the party will also uh, perhaps uh, change some of the so rhetoric in relation to, the, uh, uh, to those with a longer education. That's always been kind of uh, so uh, skeptical, if not directly opposed, for example, to academics or... Uh, particularly to the, the, what they consider the academic uh, political class, saying that these so political classes uh, among particularly social democrats and so on, they do not know very much about real life. Mm -hmm. They come from social sciences and directly into uh, so a, a, a kind of a, a political career. So uh, they might, it might be changing, but uh, there's hope in the sense of uh, newer generations being a little bit uh, less convinced by the rhetoric of the populists, I would say. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you, Andras. Thank you, Susie. Thank, thank you, you um, Hannes, who um, had to leave uh, very calmly and very silently. Mm -hmm. And thank also you. very much thank you that you're interested in these topics. I think it is very important that we actually talk about it, that we consider that we also think about what can we do about it, even if uh, there are many possibilities. Nobody really has the solution, but we should keep on thinking about it. I would now uh, like also to invite you to a glass of wine if you would like to stay. Um, the wine is coming. It's not there yet, but... Um, Otherwise, I wish you to get home safely. It was very nice to have you here and uh, enjoy yourselves and thank you for coming. Goodbye. Yeah.